So let me start here. People who study sudden cardiac death, whether it's at the population level or at the molecular level, start with this. First line in any opening grant, uh, grant uh, opening line is sudden cardiac death is number one killer. Um, and it's more than the other top five causes of death combined. Now, what is this based upon? It's actually based upon death certificates. And death certificates are nothing but the best guess of the last person who had seen that person, right? So basically, basically why is sudden cardiac death the number one killer? Because we say it is. We really know. Here's a, a paradigm that's been in place for 20 years. This is a review article 20 years ago from New England Journal. Um, as Robin said, if you start from the bottom to specialists in the field, we think that sudden cardiac death has these ventricular arrhythmias or asystole. And if you go backwards from that, we have various triggers. But here's the substrate for sudden cardiac death. So approximately 80% over the years has been attributed to coronary disease whether it's acute plaque rupture and acute MI or a prior scar mediated uh, a ventricular arrhythmia. So 80% overall has been over the years thrown around as the number of cases caused uh, by um, coronary disease, sudden cardiac death. And then another 10 to 15% uh, might be um, cardiomyopathies, whether it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, the types of uh, heart failure that maybe Robin might see in his clinic. Um, and then, um, Robbie and myself in, in electrophysiology might see the 5% or so mm -hmm. that are the inherited arrhythmia, so normal hearts. So this has been sort of in place for 20 years, this is the construct for sudden cardiac death. Now, with that in place, my first K award about 15 years ago was to study, this is back before genome-wide studies, um, and we had to do candidate gene studies. And I, my hypothesis at the time was, okay, we've been using ejection fraction to risk stratify patients for sudden cardiac death. But still, that doesn't capture everybody. Maybe there's genetic influences. In the middle of my cave, this huge study comes out in circulation, sort of uh, uh, scooping me. And they studied the exact same gene. And they had tenfold more cases than I did. 4,000, actually 5,000 community-based cardiac arrest cases that had been co collected over the prior 30 years in the Seattle area. For those of you who don't know, um, the field of, of cardiac arrest that well, Seattle is credited with all of the 911 protocols and CPR and ACLS. So they are really at the, the initial um, forefront and, 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 and um, you know, vanguard of, of cardiac arrest for many years. And so smart investigators have been collecting cardiac arrest cases in the community for <laughs> 20 years. And they published um, on the exact same beta, beta adrenergic receptor uh, gene that I wanted to study. Um, and they reported this higher risk in this one variant. And that was exactly the same gene I wanted to study. And in my much smaller cohort, where I looked at VF, people who were resuscitated from VF and came to the cath lab and had a STEMI. Okay, that was my, that was my definition of sudden cardiac death. Then compared to STEMI cases that came in without ventricular arrhythmias, that was my case control study. I found the exact opposite in this variant. So they found a risk with this variant in 10 times more people in 10 times more cases, I should say, and I found a protective effect. And so my, my, my study got into Heart Rhythm, which was a great journal. It still is a very good journal. It was the only EP journal at the time, but theirs got into circulation, okay? So here I was um, at the end of my K thinking, well, how am I gonna study genetics? All these other cohorts are now going into genome-wide studies where you need thousands of cases. And here I was, a small fry. How am I gonna reinvent myself? And it got me into thinking, how can these, both these rigorous studies be true. One, I showed deleterious effect, and they showed, or I should sort of showed a pr protective effect, and they showed a deleterious effect. So how can both of these things be true? And it turns out, as, well as, as you'll see later, it's all about the phenotype. So what exactly are we talking about when we say sudden cardiac death? How do we study this condition? So let's go into a little bit of history. So how do you define sudden cardiac death? It's based on death certificates or EMS records. EMS records, by the way, um, um, where EMS primary impression cardiac arrest is all you need for a, a case to be called cardiac arrest. All you need is a paramedic to have come on scene and said that that was, that was a cardiac arrest. Or you can use epidemiologic criteria like our societies, ACC, AHA, Heart Rhythm Society, or World Health Organization. And I'm just going to summarize the, the criteria right here, which is in our guidelines and hopefully they'll change soon. But in our guidelines, witness death within an hour of symptom onset, 
or unwitnessed death within 24 hours of being observed alive and symptom free. That's the definition of sudden cardiac death that we've been using for decades and decades. And that was the definition used in this study. Whereas I said, as I told you earlier, mine was VF in the setting of STEMI. Okay. So, but how do we know these are cardiac, right? They presume cardiac cause. And so incidence estimates are all over the place. And so if you then dig into the methods of randomized clinical trials or cohorts, and I'm not going to read these definitions here, but they essentially parrot what I mentioned to you. So one hour of symptom onset of witness, 24 hours of, of last being seen alive, right? So whether it's uh, cohort studies, whether it's a metoprolol a randomized clinical trial for heart failure, whether it's the original Hinkle failure study of sudden arrhythmic death, or a recent defibrillator trial. Okay, same. Everybody uses that, that definition. Um, but has this definition been naked this whole time? So 90% of these cases occur out of the hospital, right? In fact, if they occur in the hospital, they're not considered a sudden cardiac death because they're not sudden. They're more gradual. They're, they're expected. Um, and they, therefore, in the medical examiner, the coroner's jurisdiction. They're too busy with the trauma deaths, the suicides, the homicides. The, and so they're, the more likely the death is natural, the less likely they, they investigate them. So they declare sudden cardiac death 90% of the time. In fact, autopsy rates are about 10% in the United States and 20% and a little higher in Europe. Um, and you know the original arrhythmic death definition from 40 years ago was based upon 70 cases where only a quarter of them were confirmed to be arrhythmic cause. Okay, so this is sort of, for decades and decades, how, how we've been thinking about sudden cardiac death. Now, on the other side, where we've defined sudden cardiac death as being due to coronary disease 80% of the time, that's only in the 10% that get autopsied, the selected cases that got autopsied, okay? So on both sides, you have a significant bias in terms of thinking about what the actual underlying cause of sudden death is. So here's a great illustration of the problem. Um, you guys, some of you may remember this. Uh, seven years ago, one of our Supreme Court justices died suddenly at a ranch in Texas. His death was declared a sudden cardiac death where by a judge, who did not do an autopsy, let alone even looked at the body. She didn't even look at the body, declared it sudden cardiac death, okay? So imagine this multiplied by 500,000. This is, this is sudden cardiac death, is, is how we've called it. And so here, I'd like to make a distinction between sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. So what we see in our clinics are the lucky few that make it into the hospital, got resuscitated, got discharged, and then come to our clinics, all right? That's the small slice, what we haven't seen are all these cases that go to the medical examiner and they don't look at them either because they're too busy with these forensic cases. And so, in fact, if you look at what we never get to see, it could be any of these all underlying causes, right? And as Robin said to you, what we really care about are the arrhythmic deaths, the cases where it could have been rescued by a defibrillator. That's what all of our ACLS protocols do. That's what our defibrillators do. They only rescue the arrhythmic cases. So that, those are the cases in gold. Okay, so the gold causes, the, all the other causes would not have been saved by a defibrillator and therefore shouldn't be considered sudden cardiac death or sudden arrhythmic death. So if you're going to study this problem, how would you do it from a population level, right? Because these cases are happening in the community, the 90% of the cases that we're not getting to see. And so one of my um, colleagues, Dr. Chug, actually started a study in Oregon 20 years ago now. And it's a Herculean effort on his part. He partnered with all the EMS, all the ambulances, all the emergency departments to track every one of these cardiac arrests. And he pu he's published a number of uh, insightful um, discoveries based upon his cohort uh, called the Oregon Sudden Unexplained Death Study. He's since moved to Cedar sinai where he's uh, started another study in Southern California. Now, how did he define sudden cardiac death? Using the WHO criteria, using the cardiac arrest criteria, as I mentioned to you. And no fault of his, the autopsy rate in his study is 11% because the medical examiner in Multnomah County can only get to 11% of these. So if you think about it, only one in 10 of his cases were confirmed to be cardiac. The rest of them are presumed to be cardiac. So what I did instead was I thought, hmm, if we want to study sudden cardiac death, we need to narrow down those sudden deaths to the actual cases that are truly arrhythmic. And then we can study with that type phenotype molecular mechanisms, genetics, proteomics, whatever, whatever. So it sent, then I flipped into a detour, a 10-year detour in clinical research. And I'm going to tell you that story here. 
So instead of working with every emergency medicine, uh, or emergency room, every ambulance, every EMS, I thought, let's work with the one person that would know about every single sudden death in the community, and that's the medical examiner, because every single death has to be reported to her. So I only have to work with one person rather than spreading myself thin through all these places because every single case gets reported to her. So since 2011, we've been partnering with the medical examiner um, in this study. And uh, a few years ago, we published uh, in circulation the first three years of this study. And here I'd like to give a huge shout out to Dr. Moffitt, who's the deputy medical examiner in San Francisco. She's been an amazing partner with me in the last uh, 13, 14 years. Um, and she does all the work. I get the fun job of reporting the study. Okay? Um, and so for those of you who haven't visited uh, or been to our beautiful city, um, it's about 800,000 people at night, 1.5 million and during business hours where people come in, although that number is probably less now with uh, work from home. Um, and it's really diverse, which gives me the power to look at various groups, uh, various subjects, various ethnicities, any, any differential risk in, in various groups. Um, we have IRBs with every hospital. Um, and so I can pull records from any hospital. Uh, if somebody had visited a uh, hospital. So I kind of have complete medical history prior to death as well. Um, and so this is a busy slide, but I'm just gonna take you through very briefly. We start with every single adult death in San Francisco County between age 80 to 90, okay? And so somebody's asking, why are you studying 80 year olds of sudden death? Well, we're putting defibrillators in 85 year olds. So we should study sudden death in 80 year olds. So anybody 18 to 90 gets reported to the medical examiner and then we look at those reports and say, which cases were cardiac arrest, declared cardiac arrest by uh, the, the EMS? And then we select those cases to do not do an autopsy. And so over the um, three-year period, the first three years of the study, we reviewed 20,000 deaths, 12,000 of them were reviewed or were reported to the medical examiner, 900 of them, 912 of them had cardiac arrest stated by paramedics. They, were not resuscitated, but so came to the medical examiner. She did almost 900 autopsies. And then we pulled together all the pre-mortem data and decide, did that death actually meet sudden criteria? Right? So let's say they had chest pain for five hours, that's out. Let's say they hadn't been seen for 48 hours, that's out. Let's say they had drugs at the scene, that's out. And so in fact, from the 896 autopsy cases, we threw out 371 that did not meet the WHO criteria. That left 525 cases that would be considered sudden cardiac death in any other study, in the randomized clinical trial, in the Oregon study, in cardiac arrest literature, these are sudden cardiac deaths, okay? So here I'm gonna take a quick example. This is a 74 year old guy who I actually saw in the hospital. Um, he was admitted, uh, he had ischemic cardiomyopathy, he was admitted for fever and bronchitis. I was consulted because he had runs of non-sustained BP. And the consulting cardiologist said, will you implant a defibrillator? He meets criteria. And I said, well, he's infected. Um, you know, let's give him antibiotics and I'll schedule him for a defibrillator as an outpatient a month later. He went home. Two weeks later, he's found dead. And my medical examiner called me and said, guess who's on the table? I said, oh my God, I missed the opportunity to implant a defibrillator in this guy. Um, he had returned to his usual state of health. He was in no complaints. His wife found him dead next to her the next morning. Turned out at autopsy, he had two and a half liters of fresh blood in his gut, okay? So he died of exsanguination. He died of GI hemorrhage. So had I implanted a defibrillator, he still would have died suddenly from this GI hemorrhage. He may not even survive the procedure, okay? So here are all the autopsy etiologies of those 525 cases I described to you. In red are the arrhythmic causes. In green are all the non-cardiac causes. And in blue are the cardiac non-arrhythmic causes, okay? So arrhythmic, we essentially asked at autopsy, if a defibrillator had been present, would they have lived, okay? So collectively, the arrhythmic causes were 56%. So only a little over half of all traditionally defined sudden cardiac deaths are actually arrhythmic deaths, okay? A full 40% were not even cardiac at all. And approximately 4% were what we call cardiac, but non-arrhythmic. So these would be, for example, tamponade cases, acute MI with wall rupture, there's cardiac, but they, a defibrillator would not have saved them, okay? And so um, our case I just shared with you would fit right here in this slice, GI hemorrhage, okay? Here I'm gonna show, share a second case. Here's a 70-year-old Caucasian gentleman. He had coronary disease and he had bouts of syncope. And he had a, a loop recorder placed 
to work up the syncope. Nobody knew exactly why. He was found unconscious by his wife. EMS was called. He was found in a cystic and resuscitation was attempted without success. At autopsy, we saw the coronary disease, but no acute MI, LVH, cardiomegaly. And because he had the loop recorder, we were able to interrogate his loop recorder. Guess what we found? So this was written up by a medical student working with me. Now she's a resident, um, Emily Siegel. And as you see here, gradual prolongation, and then he goes into two, a little bit too type two heart block, eventually asystole. Okay. We said, aha, that we missed an opportunity to put in a pacemaker. This guy died of an arrhythmic death. It's documented right here. Well, at autopsy, as I showed you the gross autopsy, nothing acute, and we may have concluded that it was the coronary disease. However, on toxicology, he had a fentanyl level of 28 nanograms per milliliter. And so for those of you who don't know toxicology, I don't either. That's more than threefold higher than the lethal level of fentanyl uh, toxicology, okay? So this person died of an opiate overdose, which causes respiratory depression. And that led to the asystole, which was secondary. So if you play the thought exercise of a pacemaker in place, he still would have died suddenly of a fentanyl overdose, okay? So collectively, this was the largest non-cardiac cause, what we call occult overdoses, okay? So about one in six of our cases, I'm going to remind you, these cases were called cardiac arrest by the paramedics. There was no evidence of drugs at the scene. In fact, over 100 cases with drugs at the scene, we threw out a sudden cardiac death. So these are truly occult cases. Nobody knows how many cases there truly are unless you do toxicology, which is what we did. And so when we first started our study in 2011, this was before the opiate epidemic was recognized. And now we know that many of these cases are probably hidden. And so um, it turns out that if you were to extrapolate the 400,000 cardiac arrests that are reported per year in the United States, and you say one in six of those for extrapolating from our data, that's actually 60,000 missed, 60, missed overdose deaths in the United States, which is double the reported overdose rate. Okay, so many overdoses are actually hidden among cardiac arrests. Um, and so if you think this is a San Francisco only problem, this is a great study out of the, uh, Denmark where they went back and looked at 620 autopsy sudden cardiac deaths. They ran toxicology on them. Over half of them had positive toxicology. Okay, so this is a problem worldwide. What about urban versus rural? Well, if you look at CDC data, overdose rates are overlapping essentially, exactly the same whether you're urban or rural. So this is a problem. Overdoses hidden among cardiac arrests is a problem wherever you live. And what, how can you feed this back? to actually save lives. So we started doing this in San Francisco where we start implementing Narcan at the scene of cardiac arrests. It's a cheap, easy, harmless intervention and you can save those causes of cardiac arrest. So here's another case, a 78 year old woman who had dilated cardiomyopathy. She had um, ejection fraction 25%. She had atrial fibrillation and had an ICD implanted for primary prevention, Us usual state of health. Three hours later, her husband came back after shopping and found her dead. Um, paramedics responded, she was already in a Sicily, so no resuscitation is attempted. She had a defibrillator. So we had the opportunity to interrogate her defibrillator. And for those of you who don't see this often, we, we see atrial fibrillation with, with, with um, or actually a uh, sinus rhythm here with conducted beats. And then she goes into VF and gets shocked appropriately. And we saw this 30 times on the defibrillator, post-mortem, 30 times. So this meets any electrophysiologist, any cardiologist education criteria for arrhythmic death, right? You have documented VF, shock. It's just that the battery ran out after 30 shocks. It turns out at autopsy, she had a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the subarachnoid hemorrhage caused the VF. And how do I know that? Well, maybe, you know, I asked the question, well, what if she had VF and then hit her head and caused a hemorrhage? Playing CSI with all of these cases, I learned you need a perfusing rhythm to have that volume of blood in the cranial vault. So we know that the subarachnoid hemorrhage caused the VF, not the other way around, okay? Um, and so we also have learned this neuro and heart connection. And for those of you who've worked in the neuro ICU, you see runs at an SVT all the time with these high intracranial pressures. Um, and so in this case, the subarachnoid hemorrhage caused the VF. So despite rhythm, and, rhythm documentation of the ventricular fibrillation, the cause of death is neurologic. Um, and so this turns out to be the second largest non-cardiac cause in our study, okay? So 40% of cases are non-cardiac, one in six are overdoses. Second 
overdoses or neurologic causes collectively. Okay, so these would be strokes. These are subarachnoid hemorrhages, subdural hemorrhages, and SUDEP. So SUDEP is a condition called sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And so collectively, we coined this term sudden neurologic death because these cases have been missed and hidden among sudden cardiac deaths. And so Anthony Kim, um, who uh, was a junior faculty at the time, he's now the director of the Stroke Center at UCSF, led this sub-study. And it turns out that women and non-whites had a higher risk of these events. And being on an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet really increased your risk for these events. And then again, if you extrapolate our study results to the general community, there are potentially 25,000 missed sudden neurologic deaths annually. And that translates to a 50% higher rate of intracranial hemorrhages than the neurologists have been uh, studying in their epidemiology. And, and I remember Anthony saying, boy, these cases are like nothing I've ever seen before. And I said, yes, because the cases we studied have been recognized, have survived to have their MRI. And so they, those study, the cases that they studied are actually the less severe cases. We have the collection of the most severe presentations of neurologic death, right? And so that sort of fills in the picture of what exactly kills you suddenly. Um, and so, um, in fact, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So if you ask a panel of cardiologists and electrophysiologists um, to adjudicate sudden deaths, you were gonna call it arrhythmic, even with postmortem data. And so we did this study where we sent all of our cases that had any seizure history to a team of neurologists to adjudicate SUDEPs, right? So we found seven SUDEP cases in our original circulation series, and they found 25, okay? So in fact, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. To a team of neurologists, they found three times more SUDEPs than we did with the same data, okay? So that gives you a sense of even with deep postmortem uh, data, there's still um, room for interpretation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the diverse nature of San Francisco County gives us the opportunity to look at various subgroups and their risks. Okay, so Sat uh, Ramakrishna um, worked with me for many years, um, starting in residency and fellowship, and he, he's led a number of studies. He's actually now here at Utah, I think the director of Structural Echo. Okay, yeah, um, and so he led this sub-study. And so it turns out the highest risk of arrhythmic death, as I mentioned to you, autopsy confirmed arrhythmic death is in black women. If you use reference whites as one, they have a two and a half fold higher rate risk of arrhythmic death, even excluding all those non-cardiac deaths. Um, and, it, and Hispanic men and Asian men are actually about half the risk of white men. So there's a huge difference in risk of sudden arrhythmic death based upon your ethnicity. And then how about in women versus men? Um, turns out about two thirds of causes of sudden death in men are indeed arrhythmic in red hair, 61%. In women, it's actually less than half. So if you think about a woman dying suddenly, meeting that criteria, less than half the time is it arrhythmic. More than half the time is a non-arrhythmic cause. And those causes were neurologic, as I mentioned earlier, but also pulmonary embolisms really made up a big chunk of the pie for women. Okay, so those, there's actually reason to study women separately from men because the underlying causes are quite different. So, how about QT prolonging medicines and sudden cardiac death? This has been a long, under, long stated association between the two, right? Well, what if you were to then look carefully and see, does, is it truly associated with arrhythmic death after you strip out all those non-cardiac causes, non-arrhythmic causes? So this study was led by um, Tim Simpson, who was a medicine resident at the time. He's actually a trained pharma, uh, pharmacologist as well. And so what he did was he quantified the QT prolonging drug exposure risk of all of our 525 cases and we compared them to 104 trauma cases. And then we looked at risk of sudden death in those cases in our study. And here at the top, if you use the presumed sudden cardiac death definition, indeed, with low, moderate, or high QT prolonging medicine exposure, you had an increased risk of sudden death here, right? So increased risk of sudden death, lower risk of sudden death. Now, if you peel back the curtain and looked at the arrhythmic death separately from the non-arrhythmic death, look, look here, the association with type of sudden death was actually stronger for the non-arrhythmic causes than the arrhythmic causes, right? So everyone, and for every uh, uh, tertile of exposure, um, low, moderate, or high, the risk was higher 
and the non-arrhythmic deaths and the arrhythmic deaths. Okay, so now we're not saying that QT prolonging medicines are not associated with arrhythmic death, right? Because almost certainly if we look at more cases, there would be an arrhythmic death signal here. But it turns out more often you're dying of a non-arrhythmic cause when you die suddenly with, with QT prolonging drug exposure. And why might that be? It actually turns out, uh, for example, the causes of death were confounded by the indication for that QT prolonging medicine. Uh, prescription. So, for example, somebody who was prescribed methadone, their cause of death was actually overdose. If they're prescribed erythromycin for their pneumonia, they actually died of the pneumonia, not of an arrhythmic death. Okay, so it's confounding by indication. So, if you look carefully, you know, the actual risk of arrhythmic death is lower than we think it is with QT prolonging medicines. So, how about my mitral valve prolapse? So, mitral valve prolapse fits right here in this little slice here where we had, and I, I forgot to go into this earlier, but um, one in 10 cases were acute CAD. So these are plaque rupture causing acute MI. Two in 10 were chronic CAD. So we saw scar in the myocardium and associated coronary disease, but no plaque rupture. And then we had cardiomyopathy, so it was 10%. Hypertrophy was another 8%. Okay, so collectively, these are the, all the arrhythmic causes, right? By the way, coronary disease co causes combined was only a little over a third. So not 80%, but about a third of overall causes and a little over half if you look at the arrhythmic causes. Okay? But in terms of um, mitral valve prolapse, it belonged in this little slice of other. So again, mitral valve prolapse has long been associated with uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, this study was led by Francesca Delling, who was a junior faculty member, and now she's gotten her first R01. I'm not going to take credit for her first R01, but she worked with me, and her interest is in mitral valve prolapse. And she said, let's look at all your cases and see how many of those had mitral valve prolapse. And so she went and pulled all the available echocardiograms in our cases, turns out about 100 cases, and she reviewed every single case for how many had mitral valve prolapse. So it turns out about 2% of the overall pie of all presumed sudden cardiac deaths had much about prolapse. And if you throw out all the non-cardiac cases, it would actually enrich it by four, uh, by double. So 4% of arrhythmic deaths in the community are due to much about prolapse. And uh, post-mortem, it turns out um, half of them had mono leaflet and um, um, uh, the other half had, uh, or 100% had mono leaflet and 29% and, and, and of the non-arrhythmic cases had a mono leaflet. On histology, what we found was instead of replacement fibrosis, which has been reported, it was interstitial fibrosis, which, which was common among all these cases. So these are, this is a type of fibrosis that's not um, consolidated into a scar, but fibrosis that's in between the fibers of myocardium. And I'll go get, get into that theme a, a little bit more later. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit of a segue, but if you have a window into every single sudden death in San Francisco County, um, Early on, I noticed how come there's so many HIV cases dying suddenly? And so I went back and partnered with Priscilla Hsu, who also was a co-fellow of Robin and mine. She's now the, direct, uh, the chief of cardiology at San Francisco General. Um, and I said, let's look at sudden cardiac death in, in the HIV clinic. And it turns out, using the presumed definition, we found that the rate of sudden deaths, using the presumed definition, was fourfold higher than HIV negatives, okay? And so this is a paper published you know, 10 years ago or so. And after that, I said, well, we need to really dive deeper into these cases and look at HIV cases specifically in our study, which is what we did last year, uh, or two years ago, we published this. In using the autopsy definition, is it truly higher? And it turns out, um, you know, we use the same sort of uh, uh, methods as, as I showed you earlier. Every single HIV case, we uh, did the same protocol. Um, here we had a 99% autopsy rate for these cases. Um, it turns out in the HIV cases, overdose was threefold higher than HIV negatives. Approximately half of HIV cases were also arrhythmic, um, and that proportion was similar than the HIV negative cases, but the big signal was HIV, ne HIV cases were dying of occult overdose a lot more frequently. And that's no surprise because I think a lot of the health-related behaviors um, coincide with, um, with um, a drug use in HIV community. Um, however, if you look at the autopsy definition, the rate was about two-fold higher. So not four-fold higher, but approximately two-fold higher after you throw away all those non-cardiac causes. But still, HIV cases are dying suddenly of arrhythmic causes about double that of HIV negatives. 
Now that led us to look more specifically at the pathology. Okay, so if you look at these hearts, what is it that's different about the HIV hearts and the HIV negative hearts? We, it turns out we didn't find any differences in gross pathology. So the level of coronary disease, no different. Scar, uh, valvular pathology, no difference. Cardiac mass, no difference. It's atherosclerosis, no difference. So, um, you know, all those published associations of atherosclerosis and coronary disease in HIV um, patients, um, we didn't see a higher rate of those among sudden deaths. What we did see, though, was interstitial fibrosis being a lot higher in these HIV hearts, okay? So interstitial fibrosis, as I mentioned, is you know, and this is blue, uh, trichrome blue staining of our myocardial specimens. Here's the HIV positive group, HIV negative group. Um, here's our arrhythmic deaths, non arrhythmic deaths um, in both groups. And approximately 70% higher burden of arrhythmic, of, uh, tri of um, trichrome stained fibrosis in these HIV hearts. Okay, so this is the type of fibrosis that would not be picked up by MRI. It's not consolidated, it's interstitial in between the fibers. And whatever causes sudden death compared to the reference, the level of fibrosis was probably 70% higher in those cases. And so we've begun to look into mechanisms. And so here's an example. Um, this is actually data that um, the you know, journal asked us to take out. <laughs> they didn't want us to publish it. They said this is sort of hypothesis generating. But what we did here is a transcription experiment where we took the samples of myocardium and did a transcript assessment, an RNA level assessment of these candidate genes related to inflammation and macrophage uh, activation. And I don't need to tell you, and red is up regulated and green is down regulated. I don't need to tell you which cases are HIV positive. So almost universally, HIV positive sudden deaths had upregulated picture of um, inflammation in the myocardium. And that uh, up, uh, that, that, that transcriptome picture of upregulation was associated with the level of fibrosis. So this uh, data is in review right now. All right, so shifting gears a little bit more again, I'm gonna share another case. This is a 74 year old met gentleman with coronary disease and pacemaker for complete heart block. Um, he had reached elective replacement indicator. So the battery ran out of juice and he was scheduled for uh, battery replacement in our EP lab. And the morning of the procedure, he didn't show up. So my fellow calls his home and says, you know, are you guys coming? And the, and the wife is distraught and said, no, he died suddenly last night. And so came to our uh, medical examiner and she did the autopsy and the autopsy was negative. We didn't see any acute MI, pulmonary embolism, bleed, the toxicology was normal. But again, with the pacemaker, we were able to do interrogation. So what I'm showing you here is the interrogation pre-mortem up here when he reached elective replacement indicator, so ERI. Battery voltage is 2.6 volts, and he had six months of battery life left. We had scheduled him for the battery replacement, you know, three months later, so well within that window. Postmortem, his battery voltage had dropped by half a volt. Okay, so sometime in that window where the manufacturer said he had six months left of battery, he actually only had three months of battery left, and he had massive uh, catastrophic battery failure. He was pacemaker dependent. And the pacemaker also tells us that he had no ventricular high rate episodes. What does that mean? There's no ventricular arrhythmias that the pacemaker recorded. So he did not die of ventricular fibrillation. He died of asystole from battery failure. And so that gives us the opportunity to look at the burden of sudden deaths that are due to potential device malfunctions. Okay, so this is led by um, one of our EP fellows, Rob Hayward, um, who's work who worked with me at the time. He collected all of these cases and we looked collectively, by the way, about four and a half percent of cases of sudden death had a device. So CIED is cardiovascular implantable uh, electronic device. So pacemaker or, or defibrillator, uh, CIED. In those four percent of cases, half of them had a device problem, okay, that we identified on postmortem interrogation. And in those half, half in, in that half, half of that had a frank device malfunction, okay. So if you extrapolate back to the entire pie, 1% of sudden deaths are due to device malfunction. Okay, that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you believe the device company's estimates, that's orders of magnitude higher than they say their devices fail. Okay, so the only way to pick this up would be to look at systematically every single device that's in place and somebody who dies suddenly, right? And in fact, it, you, you might think, well, that seems weird that 
um, half of devices have a device problem, and in those device problems, another half are due to device malfunction. Well, in fact, if that device was, in, it was designed to prevent somebody, somebody from dying suddenly, if they died suddenly with that device, it's a much higher likelihood that they, that device had failed in some way, right? And that's exactly what we saw. So here's an example of ventricular fibrillation. I'm not going to um, um, show you, you know, walk you through everything here, but suffice it to say, ventricular fibrillation in this defibrillator case was missed only looking at the postmortem interrogation. So it was undersensed by the device and paramedics had to shock externally. If we line up the EMS run sheet with this defibrillator interrogation, there are episodes of VF that were completely missed by the device. And that's why they, this person died suddenly because the device undersensed VF, okay? So even it's not necessarily a hardware problem, the software problems, or even the way we design and program devices lead to undersensing. Here's another example. Here is an ICD lead fracture. And by the way, this ICD lead was not one of the ones that are recalled. These are the, this would be the, the, actually the ones that they tell us were safety implant. Um, and so, um, in fact, um, the cases that, that they asked us to extract and re-implant, we have never seen a single one of those uh, fracture and kill somebody suddenly. So we've been looking at the survivors in these cases, okay? So um, the device uh, failure rate um, was, was sensationalized a little bit in this, in this article. But again, the, the, the point remains that device malfunctions are orders of magnitude higher than we think it is. And the way we surveil for these device problems is through a voluntary system. So there's several problems with that. One is somebody has to be living for you to pick up that problem. Come to the clinic and find that problem and get reported, you have to be living. So if you've died with that problem, we're missing those problems. Secondly, it's voluntary, right? And so we're missing the most severe device problem. And so I've started to feed this back. I'm gonna, for the electrophysiologists in the audience, I, I, I can share with you some of the um, practical changes that we've done um, a little bit later, but um, to reduce ventricular fibrillation under sensing, I actually shorten device in, uh, um, uh, detection intervals much shorter um, because I'd rather them uh, tell me they had inappropriate shock than miss an appropriate shock. All right, so um, Satvik, I told you he's done a lot of great work with us. I'm just gonna quickly share this uh, study that he did with us, which was, what is the burden of heart failure among all of these sudden deaths? And so he went back and carefully looked at all of these cases um, and it turns out about one in five, so about a hundred of the 525 had a history of heart failure and it breaks down as about half of them had hef ref, so reduced ejection fraction, and um, a third had preserved ejection fraction and about 15% of them were completely occult. We only found them at autopsy, okay? The person didn't know they had it. They had no diagnosis. We saw pulmonary edema and dilated heart or ischemic cardiomyopathy postmortem. So one in five of sudden deaths in the community um, have underlying heart failure. If you break this down a little bit more carefully, and this is a little bit of a busy slide, I'm gonna um, focus on two points here. This is the small slice that met defibrillator criteria, okay? So um, those of you in the audience who are practicing clinicians, for decades we've been using ejection fraction less than 35% as a cutoff to get a defibrillator. Only 22 cases of the original 525 even met that definition. So our sensitivity for getting a defibrillator would only have captured 22 cases, would only have saved 22 cases, okay? The remainder had normal ejection fractions or ejection fractions that were um, well above the threshold. And here, by the way, is, is that slice with a defibrillator. They still died suddenly, right? These, this represents that slice that has a device problem, okay? Um, and among these defibrillator, I'm, I'm sorry, among these heart failure cases, one third of them had non-cardiac cause, okay? So that's less than the 40% that had a non-cardiac cause in the greater population. But importantly, those patients were dying of heart failure, they're dying of pneumonia, they're dying of overdose, they're dying of strokes. And so these are unrecognized causes that, that could potentially have been saved in the heart failure population. The, the other main point I wanted to make here is if you looked at what percentage of those patients were on goal-directed medical therapy for their heart failure, only 6% of the entire heart failure 
population of sudden deaths were on cold directed medical therapy. So there is a huge missed opportunity to uh, get people on life saving heart failure therapy, right? So we know heart failure medicines combined are going to reduce your risk of sudden death by half easily. And that alone, who knows if they were taking their medicines or if they were not prescribed their medicines, suffice it to say, 94% of people were not on full directed medical therapy for their heart failure. Okay, so I'm gonna to return to this slide. As I said, there's sudden cardiac arrest survivor and sudden cardiac death, right? And I'm gonna flip it around. And what we see is all the way at the end of the funnel, the small percentage that are sudden cardiac arrest survivors. And so what are the differences between these two populations? And so one of the critiques of our sudden death study was reviewers said, well, you're not capturing the sudden cardiac arrest survivors, which we've all the times always equated with sudden cardiac death. And I said, well, they're different, they're different. And so we did this extension of our study to look at those cases that survived to the hospitalization. Um, and so um, uh, Santo uh, was a resident and a cardiology fellow at UCSF and he worked with me to characterize, he tracked the cases that we didn't see, cases that got resuscitated and went to the hospital. And so what did we see? We start with 734 cardiac arrests. Here's the 525 that died suddenly, which I showed you. A little over half are arrhythmic. Of the 734, only 133, so 18% got resuscitated to get admitted to the hospital. Okay, so they made it to the hospital. In that population, two thirds of them still died in the hospital, right? So you got resuscitated, you still died, right? And that, that's no surprise. Look here, in that population, you first got resuscitated and you still died in the hospital. So these would be considered resuscitated cardiac arrest, non survivors, almost the exact same proportion had a rhythmic cause. Okay, so whether you died in the hospital after you got resuscitated or you died out of the hospital before you got resuscitated, only about half of the cases are truly arrhythmic. By the time you make it all the way out of the hospital, the lucky 47 cases that get discharged alive, which represents, by the way, only 6% of the original 734, they are in fact enriched for arrhythmic cause, 92% arrhythmic. If you add the 6% that were cardiac non-arrhythmic, 98% of cardiac arrest survivors are indeed cardiac, okay? So if the further along the chain of survival you are, the more likely you are to be arrhythmic or cardiac, which makes sense because our ACLS and defibrillators are only going to save the arrhythmic causes. The causes that are not arrhythmic or not cardiac, you're going to die. And so what are some of those causes? It turns out we saw 18% um, or sorry, I'm sorry, 9% of the original pie that made it to the hospital were neurologic causes, and those are 100% fatal, okay? They made up 28% of the non-survivors. So it turns out this is a missed opportunity to identify earlier on the neurologic causes that could potentially benefit from neurointerventional or neurosurgical intervention or reversal of your, your uh, anticoagulant. And so we're now starting to partner with EMS for targeted identification of underlying cause of cardiac arrest so that you could potentially get triage to, instead of a stroke center, instead of a semi-center, you might go to a stroke center, or you might go to a hospital that has both. So you have the ability to save both. Because anything better than 100% mortality means we're making a dent, right? Because for decades, we've been stuck at six to 10% survival rate for cardiac arrest. We keep saving the same cardiac arrest victims because they're all cardiac. We expand our lens and look at underlying cause, overdose, neurologic, cardiac. Then we may make a dent in that, uh, in that, uh, um, in that low survival. So sudden cardiac arrest survivor does not equal sudden cardiac death. They're completely different things. If you die out of the hospital, only half of the time are you arrhythmic. You die in the hospital, only half the time you're arrhythmic. By the time you make it out of the hospital, yes, indeed, 98% of the time you are cardiac. And that's where we make this conflation between cardiac arrest and true cardiac cause. So I was happy uh, to convince the commission, uh, this just got published two weeks ago, that we need to start considering people who meet only the WHO definition as presumed sudden cardiac death. So anytime now you read an article looking at out-of-hospital risk scores or sudden cardiac death genetics, if you look carefully at the methods, they don't use post-mortem confirmation. That should be considered presumed cardiac cause because half the time they may not be cardiac, right? And so um, 
presumed sudden cardiac death after autopsy, they're confirmed to be cardiac cause. And then there's survivor of sudden cardiac arrest. So I hope, if nothing, I've convinced you to not ever say sudden cardiac death for somebody who survived a sudden cardiac arrest. So what can we do with all these autopsy data? So um, um, James Salazar has uh, uh, worked with me since medical, he was a medical student. He's now a cardiology fellow at UCSF. What he did was, can we use their autopsy death defined causes to help other investigators refine their presumed cardiac cases to truly arrhythmic causes? And so can we also improve the WHO definition? And it turns out that using our data, if you restrict uh, the witness cases to BTBF, no surprise, that improves the definition. And if you restrict the time interval for unwitnessed cases from 24 hours down to one hour, you can really help uh, restrict those uh, causes to truly hear the causes. Um, what if you used all the predictors, all the pre-mortem variables that can be collected by EMS? So sex, race, medical history, rhythm, and you use that to predict the underlying cause of sudden death at autopsy, right? And so that's kind of what we did here. It turns out increased age, dyslipidemia, beta blocker use in male, increased your likelihood of it being an arrhythmic cause, VTVF as well. And then all these um, factors in green increase the likelihood it's gonna be a non-arrhythmic cause, right? So time since last seen normal, history of illicit drug use, uh, antidepressant use, um, PEA, depression, et cetera, we're, we're gonna predict the non-arrhythmic causes. And so we derive this uh, uh, arrhythmic death calculator which is free for download for any investigator. Let's say you have a cohort of sudden cardiac deaths and you wanted to refine these cases to truly arrhythmic causes so that you wanted to you can study the genetics or you can study the molecular mechanisms. You can plug in their age, their sex, their race, the time since last seen normal and output the likelihood of arrhythmic deaths so that you might be able to refine these cases to arrhythmic causes, okay? I'm gonna skip here because we're short on time. Um, and so, um, if you go back to the first slide I showed you, as I said, WHO defined sudden cardiac death should be considered presumed sudden cardiac death. This is a twofold overestimate if you extrapolate our data. This is a twofold underestimate, right? Because these are only the recognized strokes. Um, and then if you look here at the underlying causes, this is a twofold overestimate. It's not 80%, it's more like 40% in the modern era. And our interventional cardiologists have done a great job. Um, and this is a twofold underestimate because we saw a lot of the pie made up by these dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, and, uh, and this is approximately 1%. So just summarizing, WHO defines sudden cardiac death should be considered presumed sudden cardiac death or sudden death. You know, you, you, know, you should never use cardiac unless it's confirmed. Sudden cardiac arrest survivor does not equal sudden cardiac death. Sudden neurologic death is a significant proportion. It's a high impact target to improve survival. Overdose sudden deaths are unrecognized. Device problems are unrecognized. Heart failure sudden deaths, there's a missed opportunity in terms of um, prescribing medicines and even using the devices that we have. And then there's novel risk factors we started to identify, HIV, interstitial fibrosis. And I'm gonna leave you here with um, uh, a tantalizing morsel, hopefully for the basic scientists, which are implications for molecular studies, right? So we know that phenotype is ACE, right? On the genetic side, there's all these refinements in genetic molecular techniques, but if you don't have a good phenotype, you're not, you know, what do you study? And so in our study, we can now be able to uh, refine our cases and look at the underlying molecular causes. So uh, let me uh, reserve some time for questions. I want to give a huge shout out to Dr. Moffitt, who done all the hard work in our study, and she's been an un unbelievable partner. And also a special shout out to all the victims of sudden death and their families in San Francisco. Thank you very much.